So, Fallout is coming to our screens, and while I'm a massive fan of this post-apocalyptic paradise, Tom isn't quite as versed in this dark, cruel, but still somehow funny series. He thought it would be fun to make a quick crash course on the very basic lore and what you can expect from the series for those of you that might want to give the show a chance but have never played the games. Although, if you haven't played the games, why the fuck not, Tom? They are awesome! For the most part. I understood that reference. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already, and feel free to stop on over by our Discord if you want to chat with us more directly. Now on to the guide. The wacky world of Fallout takes place on a diverging timeline to ours, which begins just after World War II. Up until this point, its timeline shares the same history as ours, though later games and lore have suggested that there may have been some divergence before this, because Bethesda, being Bethesda, does like to throw in their own special stamp of crapulence. However, the big daddy divergence between both timelines is that in the Fallout timeline, the transistor isn't invented in 1947. Yes, these tiny little switches which were invented shortly after World War II are what separates us from our wasteland wandering brethren. I mean, I don't really see a big deal, Tom. A transistor is just a tiny little, oh my god, it changes the world as we know it. Now, later lore shows us the transistor was invented, but much later in the Fallout timeline, with some speculating it came only about 10 years before, well, spoilers. Without this invention, the world of Fallout puts more focus into nuclear technology and robotics, though how you make robots without transistors and therefore microchips is a bit of a conundrum, but they found a way. For some reason, this also causes the culture of 50s America to stagnate. Communism in all its forms remains America's public enemy number one, the retro-futuristic aesthetic of the 1950s endures and carries through into technological advancements from household butler robots, nuclear-powered cars, all the way to the military, where weapons and tech that were only thought possible in cheap, naff 1950s B-movies, like laser guns, plasma rifles and power armor, become a very real thing, alongside the more conventional stuff we see in our own modern world. Due to this divergence of technology, China, instead of the Soviet Union, for some reason, becomes the biggest communist rival to the US on the world stage. The Cold War still happens, or at least it's assumed it does, but it doesn't remain cold for long. It gradually gets warmer and warmer as the West and the East gradually take little pokes at one another for about a century. Eventually, the world starts to run low on resources, especially dinosaur juice. You know, that stuff that essentially keeps the wheels of society turning round, and tensions rise further. Hmm, I feel like there's some sort of important message in here, Tom, but I can't for the life of me figure out what it is. This leads to China attacking Canada, which has one of the last good supplies of oil and natural resources. Canada invites the US over to help them repel the dirty commies, and after that's sorted, Canada, in true to life form, politely says thank you for the assistance and asks the US to go home. The US, on the other hand, says, um, nah. Which leads to Canada's annexation, mass protests, and a lot of violence all the way down to the civilian level. However, none of this matters, because not long after these events, someone, somewhere, we have no idea who, decides that enough is enough and, well, the world is covered in nuclear fire, in an exchange that lasts less than two hours. Again, I feel like there's some sort of message or commentary to be had here, Tom, but darn it, it just keeps slipping me when I try to figure out what it is. The world is covered in radiation, and most of humanity is wiped out, and what remains is just scraping by with next to no hope of recovery in a post-apocalyptic hellhole full of 1950s looking crap. Is this the end of humanity? Well, not quite. See, a totally not shady company called vault had somehow predicted the impending nuclear disaster, and decided that it might be wise to construct sophisticated fallout shelters deep underground called vaults, for no other reason than to safeguard humanity. I mean, a company this benevolent certainly wouldn't use these life-saving prisons, I mean shelters, and its inhabitants to conduct cruel, twisted experiments that would absolutely be outlawed in a civilized world. <laughs> I thought all you dipshits were dead.
I mean, just look at Vault Boy. That's a face you can trust right there. As we can see from the trailer, a vault is likely to be where the adventure begins for our protagonist and the show. And you can expect the atmosphere down in this shelter to be sunshine and roses with a healthy dose of something doesn't quite feel right creepiness sprinkled in. That will be swiftly followed by a fish out of water story as the protagonist learns what it's like to live in the real world. Which is pretty much the premise of nearly every Fallout game. But the Vault Dwellers aren't the only ones who made it through the fire and radiation and shaped this world. Some stragglers did survive the blaze through good old fashioned hunkering down in less secure shelters, and along with the Vault Dwellers that emerged, though some might argue escaped, from their vaults early, they do what they can to rebuild society. Not all of the survivors got off scot-free though. You might notice this guy in the trailer looks a little weird, and be wondering what's up with that. It's because he's what's known as a ghoul. Basically, through totally plausible scientific thingy-mabobs, this individual has been exposed to an unbelievable amount of radiation, and instead of melting or shitting himself to death like you would in our world, his cells have mutated to the degree where he is functionally immortal and immune to radiation. With the trade-off being that he now looks like... Well, a ghoul. Two general types of ghouls to be on the lookout for in Fallout. Normal ghouls and feral ghouls. Normal ghouls, for the most part... Oh, friend! Feral ghouls... not so much. The ghouls aren't the only supernatural looking being you should be on the lookout for though. If you see anything that looks like the Hulk had a baby with Dwayne the Rock Johnson, you're likely looking at what is known as a super mutant. Now, they have such a rich, awesome lore that could fill an entire video, but the long and short of the super mutants is they are humans who have been exposed to an experimental pre-war virus called FEV. The forced evolutionary virus makes humans bigger, stronger, and outright immune to radiation. However, like ghouls, there is a trade-off times out of 10 they lose all memory of who they once were, fewer still retain anything that resembles average human intelligence, and often develop aggressive and violent tendencies, which makes most mutants hostile to anyone not like them. In the first game, they were the big bad, led by perhaps one of the greatest written video game villains ever, the Master. Again, someone who would warrant their own video. What the fuck is that? <laughs> not all of them are antisocial assholes though, and since the show is set on the west coast, where the FEV seemed to be a tad more stable, and it's been many, many, many years since the War of the Unity, basically a war between the humans of the Wasteland and the mutants and the master's creepy cult of the Unity, we'll likely get to meet some friendly, or at the very least, some intelligent super mutants. Marcus is still my G to this day. If you see any Mad Max looking motherfuckers, these are likely to be raiders, basically your default post-apocalyptic bad guy bandits, looters, and murderers. They can occasionally have some character and depth, but for the most part, they are usually just fodder for the protagonist to shoot. When it comes to the factions with any kind of power on the West Coast, you've got four players to be looking out for. The first is the Brotherhood of Steel, often distinguishable by the iconic Fallout power armor, this stuff here. These guys claim to be descended from what remained of the US military after the war, and you should probably take them at their word for it because they rock some of the biggest guns in the wasteland. They're an isolationist faction, and their objective on the West Coast in pretty much every game has been the preservation of valuable pre-war technology, to hang on to it and keep it out of dangerous hands until humanity is ready to learn from the mistakes of the past and rebuild. On the East Coast, initially the same idea. Then they tried to turn into Crusaders of Justice, and then they sort of got jumbled up and became something in between. If you want to break them down to their absolute atoms of being, you could say the Brotherhood are the closest thing to the good guys out of the powerful factions. On the other side of the coin of old world governmental powers is the Enclave. You'll often be able to distinguish these guys by their much fancier looking power armor and the general fascist vibe they give off. They claim to be what remains of the US government as well as a continuation of it, though their ideals are far from the land of the free and the home of the brave, and definitely fall more in line with a certain toothbrush mustache wearing political monster. I doubt we'll get to see these guys in the first season since the show is set 130 years after the first game and 54 five years after the second game when the bulk of the Enclave was wiped out as a credible threat. But we know most showrunners like them some fan service, and I'm pretty sure these guys will likely re-emerge in later seasons as the big bad. 
When it comes to new world powers, depending on what's happened between the start of the show and the closest game set on the west coast, New Vegas, the faction we'll almost certainly get a glimpse of in some capacity due to the timeline is the NCR, or New California Republic. These guys were started by the daughter of a small village's chief elder who assists the protagonist in the first game, and it kind of just snowballed from there into the closest thing you could call a true governmental body. Unlike the Brotherhood, who you can argue definitely have benevolent intentions in the big picture overall, if not at face value, the NCR is way, way more grey due to its size, sphere of influence and structure, and often falls into the same pitfalls of many real-world governments, with corruption and tedious bureaucracy that hinders the good intentions of its founder. They aren't the best, and they aren't the worst, and unless they have miraculously been toppled in the 15 years between this show and New Vegas, they should be the most prominent governmental body we see. The other big faction you might maybe get to see references to from the games is Caesar's Legion. Basically, all you need to know about these guys is they are Roman Legion cosplay enthusiasts, and definitely on the darker side of the morality scale. They are more civilized than the Raiders, but in my opinion, not by much. There's a lot more to them, but while they reside on the west coast, they are closer to the Mojave Desert and Las Vegas, and it's doubtful they've made their way over to LA, and since the show is set 15 years after the events of New Vegas, they may have been wiped out since they were basically the NCR's biggest opposition. As for for other elements you can expect to see, there's likely to be a hefty dose of wacky, cheesy 1950s looking sci-fi tech. All of it chunky, clunky, and retro looking. Laser and plasma guns, nuke throwing catapults, and lots of quirky robots, both friendly and hostile, along with a bunch of mutated wildlife. The most iconic, of course, being the Deathclaw, a genetically altered lizard monstrosity, and the giant rad scorpion, both of whom totally won't be nightmare fuel in live action. Hand me that cushion, please, Tom. It's for my back, not to hide behind, promise. Oh, and if you hear people using the term caps for money, don't worry, they haven't gone mad from the radiation. Bottle caps became the standard generic currency in the wasteland for some reason. That is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. And before we wrap up, the final element I would say is important to address is what you can expect in terms of tone. Assuming the show is faithful to the spirit of the games, you can expect a very similar dynamic to a Song of Ice and Fire slash a Game of Thrones when it comes to morals, especially since this is taking place on the West Coast, where the majority of factions and characters often could not be categorized as black and white, but a murky shade of grey in the games. There are of course extremes to each side, but for the most part, good guys and factions will often not be squeaky clean and may not always act out of pure benevolence, often only chipping in if it benefits them or their factions in some way, and the big villains of Fallout are often the hero in their own story, with either redeeming or sensible ideals, and in some cases you can even argue, yeah, they make a good point. As for tone, again, assuming they are trying to capture the tone that makes the game so special, you can expect a heavy dose of nihilism, cynicism, topped off with thought-provoking dark humour. The wastelands of Fallout are generally dark, bleak settings, and yet it has this goofy, naff B-movie coat of paint over it that will have you laughing at what is in reality some pretty disturbing shit. The society of the US was a pretty messed up and disturbing place before the bombs even dropped. Authoritarianism masquerading as utopian freedom, and barbarism disguised with sunshine and smiley faces. And this bleeds through into the atmosphere of the post-war world. Expect a tone that will make you laugh, but also make you think at the same time. And that is about the bare bones of it, Tom, and should prep you and our viewers who have never played the games for the world of 1950s post-apocalyptic fun that I really bloody hope this show will be. What are your hopes for this series? Optimistic? Pessimistic? Or, I don't care, get back to Westerosimistic? Let us know down below. If you're a veteran of Fallout and think there's anything else important that those new to the series should know, feel free to pop it down in the comments. 